Armored Core Law, Reuse and Development. Once nothing more than a group of coral addicts with a history of using violence to get their way, a single woman was able to kick this gang into becoming a black market armed organization. This is Reuse and Development, or, as better known to all, as R&D. History Before becoming the black market arms dealers seen in Armored Core 6, R&D was once a dozer group who made Grid 086 their base of operations. Not an uncommon thing after the fires of Ibis, which saw a rise in these groups starting to claim areas as their own, even with the PCA trying to build and survey the planet. Another group would also make Grid 086 their home, the Junk Coyotes, and it seems even before even becoming black market arms dealers, the two groups had a bad history. Was this due to their need for coral, or perhaps boredom? It's fair to say both, as with less gangs taking what coral that could be obtained, there would be more to go around, and well, with the planet mostly being controlled by a government force who outmatched these groups in numbers and firepower, a good fight between each other certainly can brighten the moods of these coral addicts. A communication record of some dozers chatting lets us see into the thoughts of some of these dozers and how they like their coral. These coral mealworms, you know, they're kinda... Bunch of crap is what they are. A teeny tiny shot of coral diluted all the way down until there's damn near nothing left. No one's getting high off that. That's why we're different. You gotta take Rumicon's blessing raw. Ah oh man, there's nothing like it. Damn right. Hit your brain with a pop and a sizzle. It should be noted here the use of the phrase Rubicon's Blessing. As this was said by Dolmayan in his own personal diaries a number of times, showing perhaps the teachings of Father Dalmayan has even reached into the dozers. Being as he was one himself though, this is not surprising. However, while this gang of coral addicts sought out their fixes and fought with other dozers, that would all change when a woman by the name of Syndicala joined them. According to Eyre, this happened three years before the arrival of 621, when Carla and her group of junk wizards and hackers joined up with the group, only within a year for Syndicala to become the boss of R&D, and turn it into the black market business it has become known for. That being said, while Carla did take this group and make them into a business some on Rubicon could only dream of, she did not change everything, for the group still kept their violent ways, as shown when a debt collector comes to Grid 086 in search of Nozak, only to be greeted by R&D members. Whoa, wait, let's not do anything hasty. I'm no one, okay? I'm just a lonely debt collector. I didn't know this was your turf, I swear. The guy I'm after, he, he's a tricky one. He could be hiding anywhere in the grid by now. Wait, no, please, you don't have to kill me. The remains of this collector can be found in a pipe where liquid lava is coming out from in grid 086. Let's hope this is how R&D went about getting rid of their kills, rather than using it as a method of killing. Reuse and development still had its violent ways about it. However, it's during this time under Carla that the group would make three types of armored cores, parts, weapons, and even their own MTs. Using these, R&D held their own in the grid, with turf wars between them and the Junk Coyotes. However, it's important to note that while Syndicala would become the ringleader of R&D and its chief engineer, she would not run R&D alone, as during her time either as a member of R&D, or when she became the group's leader, she would create an AI named Chatty, the system's admin for R&D, and holds a high position in R&D. This is shown by more Dozer Chatter, which first talks about how the PCA follows the orders of an AI, only then for the other Dozers to say, What? Huh. Guess you're right. Then again, we're not too different there, hmm? Yeah, but at least Chatty follows the boss's orders. Suppose he's just programmed that way, though. So along with this AI, who else? Well, there is Honest Brute, a man who was hired by R&D due to his smooth-talking, affable nature, which quickly caught the attention of Carla, who found him quite unlike the average dozer. However, it was later found out the man was a psychopath and a pathological liar. He fled, taking a considerable amount of R&D's funds and technology with him, a loss that was too great for Carla to tolerate. Some would say more hindrance than help he was, and we will learn later on, thanks to Coyote Chatter, that he would take all this and become the leader of the Junk Coyotes. And then finally we have Invincible Rummy. Well, perhaps his role is better said to be a good guard dog for R&D, rather than anything using one's brains. After all, his was constantly racing from coral use, making him charge at foes with little care, and being unable to remember if he was defeated thanks to the coral use. As such, he earned his title, which may have been Carla's or Doza humor about it. 
Along with all these named individuals, we must not forget the people Carla brought with her, as while unnamed and referred to as junk wizards and hackers, it is surely their efforts as well that led R&D to become a black market dealer and keep it running smoothly. With the stage set and Carla now the leader of R&D, what did she do with all this power? In truth, not a lot. Before 621 arrived, the group seemed to be aiding Walter by supplying his hound with armoured cores made by them. Even 621 arrives on Rubicon on one. We know Carla and Walter know each other thanks to the events of Bukora War, that shows Walter and Carla were both part of the Rubicon Research Institute, Walter being a child at the time, while Carla was assistant to the director of the Institute 50 years ago, and that the pair are part of a group called the Overseers. But while the life of Carla and Arlen D are tied together tightly, there will be another time to talk more about Cinder Carla herself. For now, back to reuse and development history. At the time, before 621, even with all this power at her fingertips, Cinder Carla would simply run her business, selling or giving Walter armed cores for his hounds, selling her empty creations and parts on the black market, all the while fighting back the Coties and, as a member of the Overseers, watching the Coral. This would change when Walter would come to Rubicon with 621. For a while, Walter's new hound would not know of Carla, even if his handle and her talked about their friends, his new hound and the watch point. The meeting of 621 and Carla would only come up after 621 destroys the watchpoint, leading to coral explosion from the vein the watchpoint sat upon. The escaping coral headed to the area across the ocean, known as the Central Ice Field, and Balaam, who Walter had sold this information to of migrating coral, wanted 621 to scout ahead for them. The issue was 621 did not have a way to get there, and Walter was still away on business, leading to air to suggest to the mercenary they use a huge cargo launcher at the top of grid 086, the territory of Dozers and R&D. The trip through grid 086 would not be easy however, first R would have to unlock a vertical lift to allow access to the grid, which had been locked down, no doubt by Carla or Chatty. After hacking this lock open and sending 621 up into the grid, the defence forces of R&D would not hold back, with R&D crawler MTs being the first ones to fight 621. The mercenary would keep going until they are met by Invincible Remy, who welcomes 621 by calling them a tourist, and how he hopes his boss is watching, as he plans to give this tourist a warm welcome. Needless to say, while Remy certainly is aggressive, he is not skilled in his AC, and 621 kills the pilot with ease, making a female voice come over their radio. The voice of Cinder Carla, and while 621 carries on exploring Grid 086, the chief of R&D would pass comments as they do, such as how you can't find the right help these days, and how she should have just hired them, since 621 keeps destroying her security muscle traces as they climb Grid 086, until they put down a bow's tetrapod empty, resulting in Carla's voice to come over the radio once again. It's after this chat, 621 is greeted by a demolition mech that has been outfitted by R&D with large grinder arms and able to spew out red hot magma from its large melting pot on its back. The cleaner, as Carla would call it, would be a tough fight, but 621 swept the machine aside, making Carla see that this time it's better to play nice with this tourist on her turf. But of course, 621's time with R&D's leader was not over yet, for in her eyes the mercenary had destroyed her defences, and now her turf was getting invaded by junk coyotes. This can happen in two ways, the first being a simple straightforward attack done by the junk coyotes MTs, who are using R&D black market MTs. Only these look like Bowers MTs with more armour slapped on, with some large rifles on their side, known as punchers, and the others with rocket launchers on their sides and power drivers on the back of their legs, named kickers. The other way is the junk coyotes plant hacking drones in R&D areas of grid 086, and Carla has 621 take these out before the Mercy has to take out Iguasu, who the coyotes have hired, but both are attacked by ghost MTs after. Whichever one of these happens, Carla will see it fit that 621 has paid her back for destroying her MTs. However, as she goes to lead 621 to the lift, that will take them up to the top, she tells the mercenary they owe her for this. 
The next time R&D plays a role in this story is in the mission Heavy Missile Launch Support. This is after 621 has witnessed the PCA enforcement fleet come to Rubicon. The Coyotes jump at the chance to work with the PCA, who are now affecting Carla's business, as their forces move in on Grid 086 to claim them. Carla does not take this well and decides the best way to show the PCA and Coyotes that she is not messing around is to launch three large missiles at the complicated areas of Grid 086 from Watchpoint Delta, which R&D has taken over. A fireworks show that will show them R&D's might. After this, R&D will once again only work together when Carla wishes to take back an overrailed cannon from a former member of R&D, Honest Brute, to deal with the Ice Worm. Honest Brute is hiding in Grid 012, one of the first grids built. Carla mentions how it is barely holding up, showing that even after signing with the PCA, the Coyotes got nowhere, and now they're about to lose their leader to 621. It seems 621 was doing very well in cleaning up the members of R&D, with two of the main cast, if you will, now dead, with own Carla and Chatty still around. The Black Arms market sellers seem to be fading into the background, and the reason for this was Carla was done with them. Once again, the history of the Coral War splits at this point when 621 goes off to find the Coral Convergence in Institute City. Should 621 not be working for Allmind, the mercenary will be captured and escape only with the help of R&D engineers, who have rebuilt a junk baso armoured core for the Merc to make their escape in and for Carla coming to their aid in her own AC. After this, she tells 621 about the Overseers, and she admits R&D was nothing more than a side geek, and she had to return to her real purpose. It's here R&D would start to vanish from the pages of history, Carla now using the Overseer logo on her mission briefs and only mentioning the R&D hackers when 621 helps her raise the flying colony ship, the Xylem. After this, R&D's name vanishes from the pages of history. Cast aside by their former boss, what happened to R&D once again is down to the choice of 621. Should they become the Raven of Fires, then it is most likely all R&D members are killed by the second fires of Ibis. In the Liberator ending, it's possible the group went back to being just coral addicts, only now they had MTs and ACs to throw at each other and the people of Rubicon. They could have found another boss to work for, be it one of Carla's hackers, engineers, or another coral addict. Then again, it's possible the hackers and jungle wizards Carla brought with her are members of Overseer, and as such they would not let Carla do this alone, so the choice of a new leader may be little. Finally, in the Dyer's cast ending, Either this group became Coral themselves and awoke like 621 in an AC or MT, or they were wiped out by the Coral, leaving no humans left after the release. In the end, the history of reuse and development is either to return to their old ways or be wiped off the face of Rubicon. Products The stated design philosophy behind R&D products comes from the mind of their chief engineer and leader, Carla, which is, what use is a killing machine that can't get a good laugh? This has led to R&D's catalogue of products to be described as eccentric, something not seen in a lot of corporation products. Yet this black market arms dealer certainly have quite the list of products that make some corporations look small. Starting with their muscle traces, reuse and development MTs are crawler types, best described as spider-like, that are built to overwhelm a foe with explosive and kinetic weapons, like machine guns, missiles and rockets. There is only one named version, the MBO-111 Clutch. However, it can come with different equipment, these being a shield, electro saw blades, landmines and stun plugs. The laser sensor ones equipped as seen in Grid 012 could also be counted among these, however they are only seen used by junk coyotes who most likely stole them from R&D or crudely modified some black market clutches. Another MT created by R&D is the Toy Box MTs, Heavy muscle traces who can roll into a protective ball to move about in before unfolding to launch attacks from its rapid fire weapons. Their production name is the MBO202 Toy Box, and they come with a range of weapons. These weapons are finger gatling guns found on their arms and a wide range shotgun and suppressive missiles located on their bodies. It should be noted one toy box scene is able to use a pulse shield, again, working for the junk coyotes which could have been modified by their own or stolen from R&D. This is it for muscle traces from this group, yet one cannot ignore the large demolition mech, the cleaner. The beast of a machine was made by Carla, who with its sheer size may have had help from her junk wizards, making it a product of the group. 
The cleaner, as said before, is described as a large demolition mech armed with grinders on its arm and able to spew hot molten from its melting pot body. Moving on to armored cores for this group, reuse and development made three frames, the C-2000, the C-3000 and the C-5000. The C-2000 armored core frame is meant to be used as a scout armored core, able to scout surfaces and space itself along with recovering scrap. That said, the C-2000 frame is what a lot of Walter's Hound used, suggesting this model was very popular. The C-2000 frame is the fastest AC frame of R&D's line, with low defences in all areas, but excellent stats in areas such as target tracking and quick boosting. The C-2000 frame speed is what makes it stand out, and should be used to its full advantage when piloting this craft. The one variant to the C-2000 series is one that swaps out its original legs of the crawler for the RC-2000 spring chicken legs. These reverse joint legs do increase the defences of the C-2000 and give it more load limit, along with higher jumping capabilities. However, it does take away some of the speed offered by the crawler legs. The C-3000 frame could be considered the middle ground between the C-2000 and the C-5000, with its defences being much higher but still showing a weakness to energy weapons and not losing much speed from the C-2000 frame. This frame is made of a parts named Wrecker and was meant for demolition work, meaning while it does suffer from being unable to keep track of targets, the sheer sturdiness of this craft can be felt as bullets ping off this armoured core while it boosts about. Finally, we come to the C-5000 frame, the bulkiest and slowest of the three R&D frames, but a frame built for combat purposes. Unlike the C-3000, it can keep track of a target much easier, and with its defences boosted, it loses the weakness to energy weapons the other frames have, but instead becomes weak to explosive weapons. The C-5000 may be made up of reclaimed parts, but this giant walking metal beast is a heavy AC through and through. And if dodging is not a pilot's thing, then the C-5000 is that heavy combat-ready armoured core, who can go into battle, take the shots of silly machine guns and energy weapons, allowing its pilot to unleash hell with their weapons, knowing the armour points of this AC has got them covered. Along with building these three armoured cores, reuse and development will also build three armoured core boosters. The BCO200 Gridwalker, which while developed by R&D, was subcontracted to them by El Cano. The BCO400 Mule, and the BCO60-1234. Before finally we come to the weapons production of R&D, the first weapon that should be talked about is the Overrail Cannon, used to break the second shield of the Iceworm. Again, while it's suggested Carla was the one to build this, as it was her secret project, it's most likely due to its size she had help from a junk wizards, making it an R&D product. Armored core weapons will be the final stop on this journey through the products of these black market arms dealers. Starting with arms weapons, we have the Double Trouble Chainsaw, which is used by Rummy and Honest Brute to rip into the metal of any MT or AC that gets within its range. The Bad Cook Flamethrower, used only by Honest Brute, the weapon is used in very close range to melt away an AC's defences, counting as explosive damage. The Sweet 16 Shotgun, used by Rummy and the AC built by All Mind on Rubicon's designs. While as it states in its description, not a true shotgun due to it firing individual projectiles from multiple barrels simultaneously, that does not mean a pilot should not get in nice and close and see the damage this not shotgun can produce. The Therapist Stun Bomb Launcher, while not powerful, it can build up a nice stun, allowing for heavy hitting weapons to have a clear shot. This is used only by the All Mine Rubicon AC 51014BE. The last arm weapon is the Aperitif, a siege missile launcher, whose missiles linger for a short while after launch before propelling themselves towards the target. This allows the user to effectively surround their target single handedly. The only user of this weapon is Cinder Carla herself. For back weapons from reuse and development, there is two to finish this product line. The Delivery Boy Cluster Missile Launcher. Its missiles are packed with a large number of compact explosives to carpet bomb the area. Apparently this design came from the feverish mind of a coral adult engineer. This weapon is used by Chatty and 51014BE. Last we have the Soup Scatter Missile Launcher featuring a unique construction that allows it to fire 10 missile salvos in three consecutive stages for sustained overwhelming force. 
a personal favourite of mine, and used only by Cinder Carla, the missiles of R&D certainly do not disappoint. It is here then the history and products of the black market arms dealers comes to a close. A dozer group who was made into something by the overseers, only then either to die or return to their old ways only with more firepower. This ends the report on reuse and development.